everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our final session of this academic year. We're thrilled to be joined by Professor Stephen Sachs, who is the Antonin Scalia Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. I don't think he needs much more by way of introduction. So thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate your making time for me in the last uh, session, and I appreciate all of you for coming. Um, I had uh, been under the impression that this was more of a pre-read affair um, and learned relatively recently that a presentation was expected, so uh, the following comments will be somewhat extemporaneous. Um, moreover, this paper, although it's been rattling around in draft for a number of years now, and I apologize if some of you might have seen it at prior conferences, is still really only, I mean, somewhere between a half and two-thirds baked, so it is very much uh, open to comment, uh, critique, suggestion, fundamental ideas being reshaped, feel free. I very much uh, look forward to your comments. The basic idea behind this paper is that it might be useful for us to analogize claims about what's true in law to claims about truth in fiction. Um, truth in fiction is the general category of claims about what might be true in a fictional work, even though we know that fictional works are fictional, and so in some important sense, not true at all. Um, there are nonetheless claims that we can make, like Hamlet is a prince, uh, which seem justified. Um, they seem appropriate to utter. If you put them on your exam, you'll get a good, uh, a good score instead of a bad score. That seems to capture some important feature of this practice. And yet they are not something you can necessarily get just by reading things right off the script. Um, it is a form of communication, perhaps in some sense, but it's a form that requires a kind of judgment, a kind of interpolation uh, from things that we know very strongly to things that we think we know um, that, to my mind, has a lot of similarities to the kind of reasoning that is often called legal reasoning. The place where Hart says judges don't push away their law books and just start legislating from the bench, instead they reason by analogy, I think has a lot of similarities to the process of reasoning through truth and fiction. Um, I think in particular this sheds light on a few longstanding problems in legal philosophy. Questions of nature of legal norms. You know, What are these things that are not real obligations, they're in some, they're ostensible or formal or some other asterisk word uh, kind of obligations or norms or permissions and so on. How do they relate to our actual moral obligations or actual prudential obligations and so on? Um, to what extent does morality play a role in determining the content of law? What do we do when people disagree about our legal obligations in some sort of relatively enduring way, the problem of theoretical disagreement does prove that it can't really be about social facts because eventually we just design an opinion poll and get to the answer of things. And how is it that if law really is grounded in some kind of social fact, as I think and uh, many other people think, um, how is it that so much legal reasoning takes place in the mode of something that looks a lot like moral reasoning? So you have people talking in questions of legal interpretation about how unfair it would be if we put the law up really high on tablets so no one could read it and making arguments about how we ought to understand statutes on that basis. Well, what's that doing there if we're not making moral arguments. That sounds like a moral argument, saying it's unfair. So what's that doing in a legal discussion? What are all of the sort of things that look a lot like um, arguments from political morality or political theory doing in court opinions if they're supposed to be about law and not just politics or policy or morals? And so I think that truth and fiction can shed some light on these things. So um, the idea here, and this is not you know, my own invention, other people like David Gawthorne, Andre Marmer, uh, Daniel Wodak, Adam Perry, and others have uh, tilted these fields before. They've argued that it might be useful to have in some sense a fictionalist understanding of uh, legal claims, that we could understand legal claims in some sense as, as claims about a game of make-believe. We're going to pretend now, we're going to engage in live action role-playing, this person is the president, that patch of land is Nevada, and so on. 
um, and we will organize our real life activities around this game of make-believe. And that can be useful to us. There are reasons why people want to play games of make-believe, why they're helpful in structuring uh, playtime uh, among kids, but also much more serious things among adults. You know, we create these sort of social ontologies where we have a jurisprudence discussion group, and that's a thing, and we have conveners, and that's a thing too. And we um, have our roles to play, in a way that allows us to organize ourselves and that we very well might fight over. An example I give in the paper, which I have heard in my own house, you know, why do you get to be Elsa? Uh, you always get to be Elsa. I mean, these are things that people can actually really fight over just as they will really fight over the kinds of social organization that are found in the law. And they're things of very great moment. So in just the same way that whether that is a real $20 bill or not is a social question, um, but not a, um, you know, there, there, there's not some sort of outside society fact of the matter, but it's nevertheless very, very important to people whether that thing has a $20 bill or not. Um, it might uh, likewise be very, very important what is true or false in the game of make-believe that is the law. Um, I will note in passing, you know, this paper does not commit to a particular theory of truth and fiction. In part, that's because I have not been fully convinced by any one author that their theory of truth and fiction is true. Um, in general, it works within Kenneth Walton's um, idea of uh, fictions as prescribing particular imaginings. So uh, a representation or a fiction um, authorizes us to imagine certain things, it prescribes that we imagine certain things. In his standard example, if we play a game in the woods where tree stumps are bears, um, you know, uh, other authors have called the stump game. In that game, okay, you know, that is a bear, and we might have normative aspects of this fiction. So we ought to capture bears. We ought to avoid uncaptured bears. These might be things that are part of our fiction, and we will structure our activities around them. And you can have a normative fiction even if normative claims are true or false in every possible world. So this, the, the one sort of pure truth and fiction claim I'm willing to go with um, and the, is to say I think Lewis was wrong to suggest that fictional worlds are possible worlds of a particular kind because you can have fictions that are not possible worlds. You can have fictions where somebody disproves uh, Gödel's theorems. You can have Back to the Future where time travel paradoxes occur and no possible world actually looks like that. Um, you can have uh, fictions where a box is wholly empty and occupied at the same time and that's central to the, to the fiction. Um, you know, so, so the one thing I am willing to say is possible world analysis is not where it's at. But beyond that, um, I try not to make too many claims beyond just sort of what we see from ordinary literary experience in terms of what truth and fiction claims look like. So with that throat clearing, what do we actually learn about all these different uh, areas from the comparison to truth and fiction? So first of all, truth and fiction, I think, helps us think about the nature of legal norms and obligations, reasons, permissions, etc., cetera, um, in a useful way because they have the same form of all these real things. They, they sound a lot, they work a lot like real norms, permissions, etc. But we see something about them, some sort of asterisk that indicates that these things aren't quite real. Um, and uh, Daniel Woodock's analogy, which I think is very effective, it's the same sort of difference between a real detective and a fake detective like Sherlock Holmes. Um, he, in some ways, has all of these features that we want from detectives. Um, it's not that there is sort of Every, you know, it's not that you get a real detective by taking Sherlock Holmes and adding some realness. It's that you are imitating something that we might find in the actual world. And likewise, um, you might imitate what we find in the normative world. So there might be a normative world. We give an account of that normative world um, in some sort of story about it. And it looks a lot like the kinds of objects that we would find in the real world, but has this sort of ostensible flavor that they are not uh, required. They're, they're not required to line up with all of our experience about the real world. The um, it also helps because we're able to talk about 
the interrelation of legal norms and real norms. So for instance, laws will sometimes say things like transfer venue in the interest of justice. How are we to understand the invocation of these actual moral norms um, in the legal context? Well, one way that I argue in the paper that's helpful is in the same way that we think of props in Walton's term in literature. So if you have a story that's set in Victorian London, there are certain facts about the actual Victorian London that are supposed to come in to that story. Um, to understand the stump game, it matters that the stump is here and not over there. And so there's certain facts about the actual world that do come in. And I'm going to have a, more to say about that later because there's more asterisks to add there. Um, but that do come into the fictional world. And so it's possible to have relations between them without saying that the fictional world is just either a subset of the real world or a take on the real world, the sort of adjectival or perspective, perspectival uh, understandings of legal obligation. Second area that I think that truth and fiction helps is with the relation between law and morals and sort of positivism and particularly the inclusive exclusive positivism debate. Um, again, I wouldn't claim any of this is sort of magically solved by this approach. I think it just sheds some useful light on it. So when we're trying to figure out how legal norms and, so, and uh, real moral norms interrelate, one uh, critique that, or sorry, one uh, feature of legal norms and the way in which I think that they are uh, grounded on social facts is that they offer an account. Now that account doesn't have to be a fictional account in the sense that it's meant not to be believed. Some stories are true stories. Some stories are offered as true stories. So you think of the ISLM model in macroeconomics or the Peren thesis about the medieval economy. It's a Gibbon's account of the fall of Rome. It's an account. He's not lying to us. He's not giving us something that he doesn't think is true. It's his account. The account might be wrong, might be flawed in various ways. We can still say what's true according to Gibbon's account. If you believed Gibbon, you would think this. And law has a lot of that flavor. So we will say, you know, if you believed the stuff that is seen to be in this particular legal account of a normative world, you would also think X, Y, Z. And what makes the legal account our account is that it's canonical in a particular time and place. So in the same way that we have a canonical version of King Lear, which for right now is Shakespeare's version, other societies had other canonical versions of King Lear. It could be Geoffrey of Monmouth's or Ralph Hollingshed's or the Nam Tate version where Lear survives and they have a happy ending and Cornelia, Cordelia marries Edgar and everything's great. That was the only version of King Lear performed for 150 years. And so for everybody during that period, you know, Lear lives to a happy ending would be the correct answer on your literature exam, whereas now you would get an F. And so that represents that it, an account is canonical for a particular culture at a particular time and place. And that is the aspect of this theory that forces it to be positivist. It is Anyone can have all sorts of accounts. Some of them are true accounts, some of them are false accounts. But what makes it our account in a particular place, the canonical account, is social facts and not any feature of uh, its, its moral qualities. In that way, I think that it lends itself to an inclusive positivist account, in part because stories can cross-refer. You can have you know, Sherlock Holmes show up in a story about vampires, and there's a way in which it's calling your knowledge of this other genre in the same way legal rules can call on moral norms, and it's part of this legal story. Um, the moral norms sort of serve as props in this, uh, in this legal story. And I'm happy to say more about that in the Q&A. On the theoretical disagreement question, we see people disagree about law all the time. But I think that thinking of this in truth and fiction lens helps us see some roots for that disagreement that might explain it in empirical rather than purely theoretical terms. So on the one hand, there can be an awful lot of disagreement about what aspects of a story are canonical or which story is canonical. Um, and those disagreements can be relatively fine-grained. So if you ask anthropologists about the culture of a, or a particular culture they're studying, they can disagree about a lot of stuff. And that disagreement is empirical. It is about something going on in the world. Now, um, 
the resolution of that disagreement might depend on theoretical virtues, virtues like um, you know, coherence or parsimony or all sorts of things, you know, different accounts. Um, it's not that you can sort of design an opinion poll that will immediately solve the dispute between this anthropologist on the question of human culture. And if we think of the study as, of law as in some sense a subset of the study of human culture, um, it would be perfectly understandable that if we're trying to figure out, well, what is the canonical story being told here, that we might have certain disagreements that to us seem very hard to point to the fact that would sort of resolve them one way or another, but that we're nonetheless quite convinced are empirical rather than theoretical in nature. Even when we do get to a question that seems very much theoretical in nature, where it's sort of people use moral reasoning to solve it, it nonetheless makes sense within the fiction is ultimately grounded on these social facts. So take the example of um, which I present in the paper, take the example of society where what law is whatever's carved on a public monument. Um, standard, you know, positive world. And what's carved on the public monument are two things. People can devise property by will and no man shall profit by his own wrong. And then, of course, somebody kills their grandfather and we're like, oh no, what do we do here? People could disagree about how to reconcile those two propositions and how to apply them both. What would be true in the fictional normative world where both of these things are true? What you would think if you thought these things? And yet um, not be arguing in a sort of, even in a Dworkinian chain novel sense, for the best picture that includes these things. Because the, what is true in a fiction and what makes the fiction the best that it can be are two different things. Think about the example of a story with a twist ending, like The Usual Suspects. You know, what is true in a version of the film that ends four minutes early and what is true in the full version of the film are very, very different things. And even if that last four minutes is the best possible way to extend the story, it's the best possible way to end the short version. It is not the same as what is true in the short version. So even if there's something else that would be great to write up on that wall or on that public monument, the best possible way to extend the existing legal story, that's a fundamentally more creative effort than an effort to say, well, what's true in the story? If you thought these things were true, what else would you think? And I think that finally that sheds some light on the nature of legal reasoning. When we're trying to make these analogies, when we're trying to say what's sort of inchoate in the potentially fictional account we've already got, we are arguing by analogy because we're trying to say sort of what fits, what makes sense. And I think that in some ways the, the, the invocations of political morality and political reasoning in a lot of, um, in a lot of contexts really are trying to point attention to aspects of an existing system that one could reject if one were fully informed about morals. So for instance, if you're saying that, you know, it would be unfair to have the law written on tablets that are really high up, part of what is going on there is a sense that the law has to be accessible to the people because in this particular system, here the people rule. And that there is some feature of our system which might be the, a wrong system, it might be a terrible idea to have the people rule. In fact, that might be the worst thing we could come up with. Um, you could have arguments that work perfectly well as analogies in a system with all kinds of evil laws. You could make analogies in a system that allows property in man. You could say, well, what's the best way to apply our law of slavery to this edge case? Um, those kinds of arguments do not depend on what is actually true as a matter of morals and what someone who is fully aware of, uh, of the best justifications possible would in fact apply. And so in that way, I see this as a way of, in some ways, making Dworkin safe for positivism, trying to say, looking at the actual practice of legal argument, seeing the ways in which um, it, it has sort of Dworkinian flavors, and yet recognizing that it's not really about what is the best justification, it's really much more about what fits an existing system. And as I note, with, with apologies to Martin Luther, the idea of justification by fit alone. So with that, I will stop. I very much look forward to your questions, and I really appreciate your taking time to spend.